grass for my pony. A fire burning dry and a pot of fresh coffee just to cheer the long night. In most of North America during the early 19th century, everybody roasted their own beans, which sounds nice, and in a way it was. At least it was fresh roasted. But mostly what people would do would be to put the beans in their frying pan and then sort of stir them around on top of a wood stove. And they would get burned on the outside, they would be raw on the inside, and it would be pretty terrible coffee. And then they would grind them with a little hand grinder, and they would brew it by boiling it for like a half an hour or just leaving it on the stove all day long. Particularly, cowboys prided themselves on their really strong coffee, you know, strong enough to float a horseshoe is their phrase. You know, you really want good, strong coffee. Um, and because they put the grounds right in there, they wanted something to clarify the coffee to make the grounds go to the bottom. And so they would put either dried fish skin in, which does that job, or they would throw in eggshells, which also will make the grounds go to the bottom. So it's fairly disgusting stuff. For workers of the Industrial Revolution, a cup of coffee isn't about taste, but about keeping alert in the new steam-powered factories. With Brazil producing lots of cheap coffee, Americans can afford to drink it. All they need is someone to roast the beans. Before the Civil War, nobody had invented a really good industrial roaster, so they had the huge furnace, and it was sort of like a scene from Dante's Inferno. It was hot and smelly and awful and difficult. Finally, a guy named Jabez Burns invented a self-emptying roaster, a very clever device where it had a little screw inside, and all you did was open the front, and it would dump the beans out. And that revolutionized uh, the coffee business. The second thing that happened was a fellow in Brooklyn, New York, invented the paper bag. It was what we now call a craft paper bag, those little brown bags, and... Um, he had them printed with the face of an elephant on the front for selling peanuts. John Arbuckle was a brilliant marketer, and he decided to buy a Jabez Burns roaster, roast the coffee beans, and he would put these in these little paper bags and sell them, pre-roasted, and he became a millionaire. Arbuckles became known as the coffee that won the West. They set up depots to supply the wagon trains. Wherever the settlers went, coffee went with them. Sometimes in a pre-roasted form, Arbuckle's Ariosa was the first national brand of roasted coffee in a package, but others came. Gold, gold from the American river, gold. The gold rush attracts people from all over North America looking to make their fortune. One is a young man named Jim Folger, who comes from a famous whaling family. The Folgers were so famous that uh, Herman Melville mentioned them when he wrote Moby Dick. They lived in Nantucket, but by the 1840s, the sperm whales were pretty much hunted out. So the young Folger boys, teenagers, were allowed by their parents to take ship to the boom town of San Francisco to try to find gold. When they got to California, there wasn't enough money for all three of them to go up into the, into the uh, mining areas, and so James stayed behind, and he was eventually uh, hired as a carpenter for a Mr. William Bovee, who, uh, who was in a, uh, going to start a coffee and spice mill in, in San Francisco. Glory, would it be to taste real coffee again? Maybe an egg or two. If you had a fresh egg to sell on the trail, you could get $10 for an egg. What do you figure you could get for a pound of coffee? At that time, uh, most of the people in the gold fields were men, and they didn't have uh, all of the equipment necessary to, uh, to actually roast the coffee and grind it with them. And so uh, James Folger realized that if he could roast the coffee and grind the coffee and take it up to the gold fields already roasted and ground, it would be better for the miners. And they immediately fell in love with this product. And Folger eventually took over the entire business 
and decided that he could make his fortune not from gold, but from coffee. In the late 1800s, Folger isn't the only businessman seeking his fortune in coffee. As per capita consumption reaches 10 pounds a year, branded coffee proliferates, and the roasting dynasties begin to take shape. Joel Cheek was a, a great coffee merchant. His firm, Cheek Neal Coffee Company in Nashville, was just a wonderful, wonderful roaster. Uh, and he served the great Nashville hotel, the Maxwell House. The President of the United States visited that hotel and tried the coffee and looked at it, drank it down, turned the cup upside down and said, bully, it's good to the last drop. It made his fortune. Another very famous coffee brand that started in the Boston area was uh, two men named Caleb Chase and James Sanborn. And they began to put out Chase and Sanborn coffee. And again, they were brilliant advertisers. They, they sold a Mocha Java brand. The fact that it had very little coffee that came from Java or Mocha didn't make any difference to anybody back then. Um, and the fact that they had to pre-stale the coffee before they sealed it into something or it would have blown up. Didn't seem to make any difference to anybody and they did very well. With the family business prospering, James Sanborn takes his daughter Helen on a coffee tour of Guatemala. She keeps a diary about the conditions she sees. We have never seen a dirty Indian, and seldom a ragged one. The women sorting the coffee cherries work very fast, but they are paid only six cents a day. The people regard them as little better than animals, addressing them as chucho, a word used to call a dog. The way coffee is grown determines the social structure of many Latin American countries, setting patterns maintained to this day. In Guatemala, like Brazil, coffee cultivation leads to the rapid growth of plantations owned by the wealthy elite. And the government, run by these coffee barons, assures a steady supply of Indian workers. The meaning of coffee to the Indians 100 years ago was just a way of forcing them to work. When coffee came up here in the 1830s, 1840s, Guatemala suddenly had an export crop. It suddenly had something they could make money on, which for, what, 400 years they had not had. Yeah. Originally, this was just jungle. And when coffee was first introduced to this area, the farms were really hacked out of the jungle. My grandfather, Bernardo Hanstein, came from Germany in 1892. He found himself a lovely German lady who was my grandmother, and they then made their living on the south coast on a, uh, near the Mexican border on a coffee farm. People were brought down from the highlands with the owners of new lands that were being opened up, and they stayed. <laughs> The Guatemalan government instituted forced labor in order to make sure that they, they got the work done because the, the population had no desire to go work on farms. The Indians did not get developed this way, but the society was able to become more part of a European cosmopolitan world by virtue of, of producing enough uh, income from coffee. <laughs> Coffee has a history of, of being produced in societies that has been very oppressive. It was part of an entire world of commodity production so that an American could drink a cup of coffee fairly cheaply because the labor here was so cheap. The question is, is a much bigger one than just why did coffee produce poverty by its production? And the problem since the colonies have broken up is these independent countries are gradually trying to pull themselves out of this inheritance of cheap production for the industrial world. 
Coffee-producing nations, still struggling to free themselves of their colonial legacy, are soon at the mercy of a new master, the wildly gyrating market. In 1880, that was the beginning of what's now called the boom-bust cycle. There would be too much coffee, the price would go down, people would then be aware and, and stop growing so much, the price would go up, and then it would start all over again. Well, by 1900, the Brazilians were growing way, way too much coffee. And the price was so low that there was going to be a revolt. Brazil adopts a radical strategy, withholding part of the coffee harvest in hopes of boosting the world price. But the plan backfires. Because profits are guaranteed, farmers rush to produce even more. Before long, Brazil is buried in unsold beans. Because there was too much coffee, and because the market was artificially elevated in 1929, the coffee market crashed just a few weeks before the stock market crash. In fact, that was one of the causes of the stock market crash. And then we entered this prolonged Great Depression. Panic set in on the floor of the stock exchange as the slumped in prices wiped out the savings of countless Americans. The Great Depression quickly spreads. In Brazil, plunging coffee prices topple the government, and coffee elites install a new strongman. But unlike other Latin American dictators, Getulio Vargas rules with moderation. Faced with ruinous prices, he orders a drastic solution. Burn the coffee. Just around the corner, there's a rainbow in the sky. So let's have another cup of coffee, and let's have another piece of pie. Let us Vargas try. fails to raise the price of coffee. And in the US, times are tough too. Consumers can still get a cup for a nickel, but during the Depression, small roasters are no match for big business. Most of the old labels are taken over, and fresh roasts give way to stale, inferior blends in a can. Everywhere above the Mason-Dixon line, canned coffee became, or cans, became the way that coffee was sold in the grocery stores. Along the way, uh, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Company began to invent what we now call the supermarket. And the supermarket gave you a delivery system. And it was extremely expensive to do this, so only the largest brands could succeed. And slowly but surely, the remnant of the little mom and pop store that roasted coffee and sold coffee out of sacks and barrels disappeared. Even the oldest family-run businesses, like Folgers, are being absorbed in corporate buyouts. 